Hey everybody, welcome into the Hubcast. Uh, it's uh, just before Thanksgiving. It's our final show of the year. I'm here with my good friends, Max yeah. and Russell. Good and friends. I heard the words that every host gets nervous about right when they come on the air. <laughs> Russell said to Max, go ahead, I dare you. I mean, right before we came on the air. So if something really bad happens here, um, you know, prepare yourself. Yeah. You guys up to something over there? Uh, no. I hope so. Uh, no. Hey, look at this. <laughs> look at this. We got a we got a new champion. Did he Jim, win? Jimmy Johnson, number seven. What he about won? that? Wow. And I, you know, I, I I don't like to look in a rearview mirror a lot, but I do think that we were on the show last week. We did our rankings, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and I think my rankings were Jimmy Johnson of the four guys at Homestead. Jimmy Johnson number one, Joey Logano number two, Kyle Busch number three, Carl Edwards. Number four. That's how I ranked them. I, I I think I said the two JGR cars would be the strongest, which they were. But then I also said Jimmy would win the race. So okay, I just you know. I, I think I remember a text during the race that said exactly what was going on was happening, and then something had happened else happened that didn't I, go my way. I gotta tell you though, and Carl Edwards had the best car, right? I mean, yeah, you know, absolutely. We, he he had, and they did a great job of putting themselves in position to win a championship. You get that caution with right around 15 laps to go. Uh, those guys pit, and, and he comes out, and I mean, he's he's going to win the thing. Mm -hmm. And and then, of course, the restart, and he blocks, and Joey Logano's into him, and I don't, I don't fault anybody there. No. But all of that opened up the door for Jimmy Johnson. And he wins his seventh championship, tying Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt in that category. And to me now, the question becomes, you know, what's next? N number one, where do you guys think Jimmy ranks? Are these guys all level now that they have seven? Or, or Jimmy, given the era that he's competed in, is he now truly solidified himself as the greatest of all time? I think Earnhardt's still better than Johnson because he, he had... I believe the chase helps Johnson win those seven championships, where I don't think the, I think it's harder in Earnhardt's era, and who he beat for championships was, I think the competition was was a little more even back then. So and if then, you rank those three, it mm -hmm. would go Earnhardt, Johnson, Johnson Petty. Petty. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think I'd probably put Johnson at the top of that list, and I know you said it's, it's he gets a break with the chase, but mm -hmm. I think also in that manner, it's a little bit harder because any lead that you may have had on other guys gets erased for the last 10 races. And for him to do that, certainly five years in a row, but to do it seven times overall and in this new style chase, I think is incredibly hard, especially with the level of competition mm -hmm. we have today. But it goes both ways too, because any lead that he didn't have gets erased as well. Sure. So the, the, the disadvantage he had is now an advantage. Let, let me ask you this though. Let's let's strictly and, and, and it's so hard to compare because of the different formats of the chase, mm -hmm. especially the one that we've been in the last three years. I mean, I mm -hmm. I think the, the the format that we've been in 2014 to now is by far and away the most difficult format to win a championship because mm -hmm. you you can just have one bad day. Jimmy found this out at Dover. One bad day at a track where you're really good and your championship hopes are gone. Yeah, Martin Truex Jr. was Martin the favorite Trish this Jr. year. Yeah, I mean, bad luck at Talladega. And, and while Kevin Harvick, I don't think they had as much speed in the chase as what we're accustomed to seeing. You know, here again, I mean, you know, you you have a, a bad day or two, or just miss it a little bit, especially in that round of eight. You're not going to go to Homestead. It's just not it's yeah. not going to work out for you, especially when you have three other guys that win and get their way there, which is what happened in 2016. I, I think, though, when you take that variable out, the, the style of chase and the format of the chase, and you just look at the era that we're competing in and the depth of competition, I said I probably, if I had to give the best driver all time in NASCAR, would have given it to Jimmy Johnson before we ever went to Homestead over the weekend. Yeah. Because, one, he had won five in a row, which I think in any format is unreal. And think about the number of champions that have been on track with him throughout his entire career. That's why I think he is the one that stands above everybody yeah, else. Yeah, to, to beat out guys for championships like Jeff Gordon and Tony Stewart. I mean, you're talking about some Matt of the greatest Kenseth, drivers Kurt we've Bush. ever seen in this sport. And he yeah. beat them out year after year after mm -hmm. year. So what, what, what's your reaction to that argument? Uh, uh, my, 
my reaction would be that he drives for Hendrick Motorsports, which is by far has been the best team over the last 20 years. And he's got by far probably the best crew chief of all time as well. Most impressive accomplishment for Jimmy Johnson. We asked this on Race Hub on Monday night. Is it the 80 career victories, the five championships in a row, 2006 to 2010, or the fact that he's won seven? Where would you guys weigh in on that? Ooh, that's tough. They're all pretty impressive. To me, I think the five in a row would be the most impressive, and simply because it's unprecedented. Nobody else has done it. We've had guys win that many races before. We've had guys win seven championships. No one's done the five in a row. That I mean, he's in his own league, and I don't think I don't think that record will ever be touched. I think the wins record could, not really a record, but his wins, I think that could be matched. Even seven championships, I think, is still realistic. I don't know five championships in a row is realistic. See, I don't think you can win seven championships in a, or f- five in a row again because of this format is just too hard. I think that old chase format was easier to win those five in a row because it was the same tracks. It was all tracks he was super good on, mm-hmm. and it you know reset at. at but good luck with finding. 10 to go. I've always heard that this this sets up good for him because there are tracks where he's good. So <laughs> give me some tracks where he's not well, very uh, good. You I, know, I mean that's. I agree, but you look at Martinsville, Phoenix, Dover, Dover, Charlotte, all in the chase, all super good. At, he's super good at those. So I think the most impressive feat is the five in a row. Mm-hmm. I do. I mean, and, and regardless, I mean, I, it, to, to do it over and over. And the, the pressure that continues to mount as you do it makes each year that much greater than the one before. So I think the five in a row is the most impressive. And he did that over different car generations. Yeah. Absolutely. There were a lot roles. of changes in that period, yeah. which takes us back to the point that Russell made. He's doing it with Chad Canal. So you you know, Dale Inman was unbelievable. But again, I go to the depth of competition and all those things. When you look at this era that the 48 team is performing in, it's hard to not look at them and recognize them as the greatest because of, of what they're up against. And, and I would say this too. You know, Chad Knauss really became a crew chief at, at a high level in 2002. What did we start to see in, in 2002 or shortly after? The engineering influence atop the pit box. I, I think we are at a time now when, when the crew chief position plays as critical a role as it's ever played. And for Chad to withstand what he has withstood and, and this engineering influence, which is not the background that he subscribes to, makes what he's been able to accomplish you know, that much more impressive. So, we sit here in 2020, and we're having a conversation about Jimmy Johnson. How many wins does he have? He stands at 80 right now at the end of 2016. How many championships does he have? What do you, what do you guys think the next few years holds for the guy that just picked up his seventh title? 92 and seven. So you're saying he's going to average three wins a year, mm-hmm. and he's not going to get another champion. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I was I was very close with that. I would have said ninety and seven. I think ten is realistic. I think maybe the last year. If we're talking about that fourth year being his last year, we're probably going to see some fall off at that point. We saw it with Tony Stewart. Um, I I think it falls off. I think he can hit ninety though, but I to predict that he wins another championship is just so tough, especially with the level of competition, the format that we have. And with it ending at Homestead, is going to make it tough simply because you you got to have to go out and win that race. We know that's not one of his best tracks. He didn't have the best car this past weekend, and he, he got a little lucky, I think. And oh, he got, got it. super lucky. He had two, yeah, he three did. cautions. Really, three cautions won him that race. Now, I will say this, though. I will say this. Were they fortunate? Yes. yes. And I think it's hard to look at a champion – in any sport, in any season, where at some point you can't point to luck playing a factor in, in the outcome of the event. Sure. I mean, it, you, if you're going to win titles in big-time professional sports, you need some things to go your way. Absolutely. The one thing I will say, though, about Jimmy at Homestead is that they had to start at the back. Now, you could argue that, that they were working on that race car and that was a self-inflicted wound. Whatever the case may be. You start at the rear in a 400-mile cup race that, that had a pretty quick pace. That's a, that's a pretty big disadvantage. So immediately they, they started behind the eight ball, and they worked themselves right into the game. Now, were they number four of the four chase drivers with 20 laps to go? Yeah. Yeah, you would, you would say that but they But the they whole were. race. The whole race, yeah, basically. Yeah, right, right. But I'm saying even when it got down to it, they mm-hmm. still were. But... 
they had put themselves in a position to have a chance, which... Which is all you can do at that point. Which really is, you know, easier said than done, given the circumstances in the hand that they were dealt. Sure. Um, no, no, it's it's not a slight on them for winning this race. I just think, is he going to win another championship? I think it's going to be tough because that's not one of his best tracks. And we know guys like Carl Edwards and Kevin Harvick and Kyle Busch, guys that could be contending for championships are very good there and have very strong cars there. I think that stacks against him getting another championship. The one thing that impressed me so much with him over the weekend, and I, and I, I would say that this really held true in that final restart, is the will to win. And I think that it's very cliched to talk about that with someone who's had as much success as Jimmy has had. But I do think it's a, a quality that you can't look the other way on when you start talking about guys that have had repeated success. And Jimmy showed it on that final restart. I mean, I think about how good Kyle Larson had been throughout the race. I think about how good Joey Logano had been on restarts. I mean, Joey Logano was the best guy on restarts at Homestead, without a doubt. Absolutely. And I I thought when they lined up for that final restart, it was going to be Joey Logano's race to go win. I yeah. really did. And the fact that Jimmy not only was able to keep Joey behind him, but drive by Kyle on that low side and win the race speaks to me to the will to win and the the ability to deliver in the clutch which we we've seen jimmy do on a regular yeah. basis so i think he can get back to homestead and i think he can win another championship do you but think he will i i think in 2020 we're sitting here at number eight and in 90 wins i mean his his average for his career has been just over five wins a season is that right do you i don't know if you i, I think i read it's like 5.3 Somewhere average there. number yeah. of wins per season. Okay. So I I don't think I mean and he won five this year. But I think they had to work as hard to win five this year as they've ever worked. I mean and and you look at those two wins early in the season, those were boy, he had, that was he had four that were really situational based wins. They had to scramble four. to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These were not the typical go out and lead. 60% of the laps and dominate like we, we've been accustomed to seeing now that 48 car over the years. So I, I don't think they're going to win it, continue to win it at the same rate. I think maybe one other disadvantage is I think Hendrick Motorsports is, is in a, a period where they've got some soul searching. You know, the Stuart Haas operation is going to Ford. There's not going to be that, that connection, which I think has, could have a little bit of a negative impact. Um, and, you know, we don't know what Dale Jr.'s role is, is going to be. There, there are just a lot of question marks, I think, and so I think that makes makes it that much more difficult on the 48 team. So they only I, had five wins this year, Hendrick. Yeah, all of them five. were Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we, we did one of our shows, and, and Michael said, you know, the beginning part of the year belonged to Toyota, and then yeah. about July, the corner turned, and Jimmy Johnson took over. It wasn't, wasn't mm -hmm. Chevrolet, really. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Hendrick Motorsports. It was Jimmy Johnson that, that found his way and, and, and worked it out. So... Um, well, let's let's move on and look at those other three guys that were at Homestead: Carl Edwards, Kyle Busch, Joey Logano. Of those three, who will be the first to win a championship going forward? Kyle Busch, I think. I think Kyle's probably right up there with the favorites for next year going into the season. And there's, I mean, he was the favorite this year. He won one a year ago. There's no reason to think he wouldn't be back at Homestead when we get there next year. I think it's a great question because I think it's that close. But I, I would say Carl Edwards. Like really? that one stung so bad that he's 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 ready. More than 2011, you think? Oh yeah, oh yeah. He had that one won. He he had that race won basically. Yeah, I I guess for me though, 2011, and only Carl could answer this. And I think I think it's easy to say it was Sunday night because it's so here and now and mm -hmm. so fresh, right? And and certainly we can ask. Uh, Till the day we die, should there have been a caution or should there not have been? And if there weren't a caution, then, you know, Carl is, is very likely going to drive off and win that thing. But I just think 2011, he had had the year, and and it it took the greatest run, playoff run in NASCAR history to beat him and the circumstances of Homestead and everything that Tony Stewart had to overcome. It was just unthinkable and incomprehensible and it happened i you know i just yeah, yeah i i agree but the guy won five races in the chase like you can't you can't say well i deserve to win because i was more consistent in the chase he won five times in the chase right edwards edwards was right there like he was the best all night 
like by far the yeah. best best car all I, night was pulling away. There was no chance anyone of the chasers was going to catch him, and he could have won the race if he really wanted to. Now, I, I will, if that caution doesn't come out, he wins. For by argument's far. sake, I would say I could just say Joey Logano would be the next. You know what I mean? And, and, mm-hmm. I, and I'm with you. I mean, it's it is so close. Yeah. It's so close. The one thing I would would ask you guys though is is we kind of have this conversation. Toyota middle of the year, and we, we did a lot of hubcasts early this year. We were talking about how many wins can they get, and we thought they would approach eighteen. I mean, we really mm-hmm. thought they could get to eighteen. They ended up with twelve at, at Joe Gibbs Racing. For the Toyotas, and, and maybe more in particular Joe Gibbs Racing, stock up or stock down as we go to two thousand seventeen. I think their stocks down a little bit especially where we saw it from the beginning of the year. But I think overall, I think they're probably still the strongest team of out there. But when I remember we were two months into the season. It was We were wondering how many wins Joe Gibbs was going to get. We were wondering if they'd have four guys at Homestead competing for the championship. And the reality is I think they, they kind of a letdown towards the end of the season without the with what one chase win. So, to me, down a little bit from the beginning of the year. I think overall, though, they're still the top dog in NASCAR. How, how would you view it, Russell? I would say it's even. Because, you know, they only won once during the chase, but Truex won twice during the chase, which is basically, you know, a, a, an arm of them. But it's and, not and them. They, okay. I think it's a little discredit to Furniture Row Racing to say that they're just taking Joe Gibbs. I think they've taken what Joe Gibbs has given them, and I think they've... Uh, they run with it and made it very, very good. I, I agree, but it's still a reflection on Joe Gibbs Racing as well. Sure. So, and they had two two guys in the in chase in the final four, which has never been done in this format before. Yeah. So I I think you you know to have all four in was you know shooting way too high when you look at how it how well, works. We all knew it was possible. Yeah. But it's pretty unrealistic to think that that's going to happen. And, and quite honestly, who who knows how it would have played out for Kyle Busch and Joey Logano. But Edwards was already in. If Kenseth wins at Phoenix, mm-hmm. we, we could have very well been at looking three. At, at three of four. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think, you know, you, not that there's a huge difference between having two or three. I mean, you know, but they, it, it's, it's so hard to measure Joe Gibbs racing right now because mm-hmm. I, they're, they're a little bit, in evaluating them, a victim of their own success because they were so good early in 2016. Right that our expectations really have been raised to a level that are unfair. And and now they go through the chase with only one win, and they get two cars to Homestead, but they don't win the championship, and it's like there's some kind of a letdown, when reality is no one was more consistent. I think about Kyle Busch. You know, Kyle Busch didn't win the championship, Okay. But you look at what he was able to accomplish in every race in the chase outside of Talladega, the guy had a phenomenal playoff run. I mean, he was incredible at putting himself, putting himself in a position to repeat. Sure. So I, I, I'm probably like you, Russ, so I would say even. I think when the conversation began, I probably would have said stock is down. But as you really evaluate their body of work and think about what they've accomplished and, and the positions they put themselves in, they're, they're in a pretty good place. And the only reason I say their stock is down is because, like, regular stock gets traded. It's all traded on projections. And I think maybe overhyped by the by the media, by us, by fans, we inflated that stock, I think, a little bit to probably higher than we should have. And so when we got the reality, I think we were a little let down. But I think in re- for Joe Gibbs Racing, I think they probably couldn't be happier with where they stand as an organization. So we've wrapped up 2016. Let's do uh, surprises, disappointments. Uh, Max, what biggest surprise, 2016? Uh, I'm going to go with Chase Elliott. I thought I, I think we all had high expectations for Chase, but I thought he had a phenomenal year, one of the best rookie years we've ever seen. He came close to winning some races, and uh, probably a little bit of a disappointment that he didn't get to victory lane, but probably one of my biggest surprises was seeing how good he was, even, even amongst the – Hendrick drivers that were kind of on a little bit of a down year uh, overall. I, to me, he was a lot of fun to watch. Gave me a lot of hope for uh, for the future. Russell, so I have two. I have Martin Truex Jr. for sure. Two. You can't say, never make up his <laughs> he, mind. Yeah, he he obviously didn't listen to the rules in the production <laughs> meeting. Okay, so Martin Truex Jr. is my surprise. Well, maybe not a surprise, but 
Yeah, I'd say it's a surprise. New, new organization this year. Switched from Chevy to Toyota. W- won two of the four crown jewels and should have won the Daytona 500. Like, yeah, that close to winning the third. 500. Four wins. Look at what he did at um, Charlotte at the 600. It was incredible. Um, I, I just think they're. that's a big surprise from that. Okay. And then I want to add William Byron, too. William Byron. Mm-hmm. Seven, seven wins. wins. Yeah. Seven wins. Most since Ted Musgrave had seven other than Kyle Busch hmm. in 2001. Yeah, and I, and I agree with William Byron. That, I, I didn't have that one on my radar necessarily. But I, I think the thing about William Byron is when you look at his history and, and what he had done and, and kind of the body of work coming in to his first year full-time in trucks and you compare it to his teammate Christopher Bell, I just kind of thought going into 2016, it was a foregone conclusion that Bell would be the guy that mm-hmm. that really carried the flag for Kyle Busch Motorsports. Nothing against William Byron, what, but he so, had never been to an intermediate track. You know, he hadn't. He didn't start racing until he was 15. Yeah, like, I mean, like there were racing, just a, period. There were just a lot of things that when you looked at William Byron, you would say it, it's going to take him a year or two to get his legs under him. Obviously, that's not the case, and I, I think. You know, you got those first couple of wins, and you're like, wow, where's this coming from? And as time went on, it became w- way more than a kid that's capable of winning races. This yeah. is a kid that is gifted and has got abilities, you know, we just don't see very often. And I can't wait for 2017 to see him at Junior Motorsports. I, I think yeah. this is a great step. I think Junior Motorsports is in a good place. I like their balance of, of drivers. And I think with the veterans they have over there, this is going to be a huge opportunity for William Byron. So I, I like William Byron. I think overall the, the youth movement in NASCAR is one of the strongest we've seen in a while. We've got young guys like Larson and Austin Dillon and Chase Elliott, and now even younger with guys like Tyler Reddick or William Byron, Eric Jones, Daniel Suarez. I mean, there's Daniel Hemrick. He has another there's one a, that's plethora of young talent coming up, which and, I think is really good. And I would say my biggest surprise probably, and, and it was something that evolved throughout 2016, and that would be Daniel Suarez. You know, we got to watch him pretty close in his rookie season, and he did some positive things, but he certainly had those rookie moments. And there were there were times that I heard the analysts that we would work with in the booth talk openly about, Daniel's good, but he's got to get better here. Daniel's improved here, but he's got to get better here. And he was never the well-rounded driver that he needed to be to go out and compete for a championship. And I think as his rookie season went on, you really started to see some growth. He was running up front on a more consistent basis. And even when 2016 began, he he wasn't well-rounded. I mean, he still had some things to finish up and clean up if he was going to truly be a threat to win week in, week out. And, and somewhere early summer, I think he started to find it. And as time went on, he honed those skills. He became well-rounded. Restarts, the one thing that he really struggled with, he became, I mean, it was no longer a liability. It was a true asset. And ultimately, that's what ends up you know, winning him the championship. So I, I would say that my surprise is Daniel Suarez. And now I think you, you hoist a bunch of expectations on him as he comes back and tries to defend and no longer has to deal with Eric Jones as a teammate who I think we all thought was the front runner going yeah. into 2016 when it comes to the Xfinity Series. Well, and he had a language barrier too, which is, oh. makes it even more impressive. You know, we, we did his story, the Beyond the Wheel story, where we went and followed Daniel in Mexico and, and, and told his background and where he came from and, and met with all the people that helped him grow up in racing, introduced us to his family and all that. And I thought, you know what, if that story had been told about a kid from Omaha, Nebraska, or Cheyenne, Wyoming, or Phoenix, Arizona, it would be a great story yeah. about a kid that grew up with his family, mm-hmm. that, that, as Daniel said, didn't have a plan but had a dream and, and made it to the high levels of NASCAR. It would be a great story. But then you factor in that it's a kid from a different country that, as you said, does not speak English. And I didn't realize until we got fairly deep into 2015 that not only is this guy trying to manage learning how to drive a race car, he's figuring out how to manage when to eat his meals between practice and just getting down the whole weekend schedule on top of the language barrier that he continued to face. It's a remarkable story. 
and um, and and I think I think now that he's been able to get over the hump and win a championship, it, it's really scary what this kid can accomplish because he's got a lot of talent. There's oh, no yeah. doubt about that. He was learning how to speak English by watching cartoons. Yeah, it's really yeah. cool. And you think about the communication with his spotter right. and all that. Uh, so biggest disappointment of 2016. You go ahead. I'd say Hendrick Motorsports. Yeah. I mean, with only five wins, and like I expected a little more out of Casey Kane, probably. Um, Chase Elliott, you know, going into the year, I don't think we thought he was going to, you know, be this big star, but we thought he'd challenge for wins, and then like, and he just totally fell off. And then the junior thing, I, there's nothing we can do about that. He can't do anything about that. But, you know, just five wins is a little disappointing, I think. Yeah, I'd say it's fair. And in, in a, a very long winless streak. Yeah. Yeah. Not, as, not near as many laps led is what no. we're used to seeing over there. Yeah. For me, the biggest disappointment was coming down at the end of the season, uh, Stuart Haas Racing kind of falling off. I thought to start the year with Kyle, uh, Kevin Harvick and Kurt Busch. <laughs> what, are you, what are you guys doing? <laughs> He's giving me eyes. Uh, those guys looked really strong at the beginning of the year. They were running the top five. They were leading a bunch of laps. I thought, they were, I, I thought for sure Kevin was going to get back to Homestead and compete for a championship. I thought Kurt had an opportunity at least, and he made it to the final eight. He certainly did. Mm-hmm. Neither of them had a bad year by any measure, but I thought, you know, for sure they'd have one in that final four. So I was a little disappointed. So you were uh, disappointed in Phoenix, basically, just Phoenix. Yeah. For Harvard. How that season ended for, for Stuart Haas Racing, I'd say. And I would say, and, and I've done this before, and I know Russell doesn't like when I do this, my biggest disappointment is not someone I'm disappointed in, but someone I'm disappointed for. And, and I'm disappointed for Martin Truex Jr. I, I think... Yeah. To me, this was the year that, that he and Furniture Row showed we're, we're not some single car team in Denver, Colorado. We are a true threat week in and week out. And he had a career year. I mean, he did amazing things. And, and his dominant win in the Coke 600 and his ability to win in, in the big races and you know, could have won three of the four, certainly. And, and then to get to the chase and get off to the strong start that I think we all expected winning two of those first three in the opening round, then to have the problems they had and and not run as good at the mile and a half in Charlotte and Kansas and, and certainly the, the blown engine and the disappointment at Talladega. So I, for them to not make the, the championship four was a disappointment. Mm-hmm. And I'm disappointed for them in that. But I, I do think, though, there's a little bit of bitterness in taste in their mouth. And, and I'm a little bit scary to what they could accomplish, especially with the aid of a teammate now in, in Eric Jones as we come back in 2017. So let's go. Let's go to questions. We got a few minutes left. What do you got on questions, CJ? Uh, so thank you to everyone that's been sending in their questions all year long. We started in the other studio and me throwing up questions to you guys on the screen. So you guys have been great. Thank you so much for watching this year. Um, I was kind of keeping track of what people were saying were their biggest surprises this year. A lot of people saying Truex in the 78 team, and a lot of people say talking about Stuart Haas switching to Ford for next year. People yep. said they were surprised about that move. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, Jim in West Virginia, he asked, what do you think is next for Greg Biffle? It's a great question. You know, we, we were talking about that yesterday. The thought process was out there that he would go and run a second car. You know, there was a rumor for a while that it would be the second car next to A.J. Allmendinger at, at JTG Doherty. Based on the things that I've heard, that, that, that that's not going to be the case. And I would say maybe the future's a little bit up in the air. I, I don't think an announcement is imminent. We'll wait and see. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Greg wants to walk away, though. And certainly the announcement didn't appear to be a retirement amount, an announcement. It was a parting of ways. So we'll wait and see. But I, I don't know that there's anything firm at this time. Um, Aaron in Texas, he wants to know your thoughts on Cole Witt's move at the end of the Xfinity Series <laughs> race. Yeah, I didn't like it. I'll say this. I don't think it's on Cole Witt. I think I think it's more on his crew chief for keeping him out there. Uh, but, yeah, I think it was disappointing to see the way that played out at the end of the race. Yeah, I, I just would like, given the championship format and all that was on the line, and as good as those guys had run throughout the evening, as competitive as they had been, all four of them, I would like to have seen it decided amongst them. And while if I were a betting man, I would probably bet that the results would be the same because I thought Suarez had the best car and owned the night. Uh, I would like to have seen all Guyer and his Jones. Head no. I would right. like to see all Guyer and Jones have their chance. Right. I Eric think Jones was far faster than Suarez at the end of that race. Yeah, but Eric, Suarez was really good on restarts, and we just had That's a short little run. I, was, now, I agree. I was there. Were you there? 
<laughs> well, I was <laughs> watching it. Okay. Okay. What the heck? I guess I we got had a better, better, we had a better view than you, Russell. Come on. Jones had beat him off pit road, and I think he had an opportunity to start on that front row. I think it it, it could have gone his way. I, I agree with Adam, though. I think Suarez had the best. I don't think you can argue with who ended up being the champion, but I think it was a little disappointing that yeah. Jones at least Just didn't have the, the opportunity to fight for it. I don't, all the fans out there, I don't think that lashing out at Cole Witt is the appropriate. I mean, I, I understand. You know, you got to you gotta do what you can, and he listens to his crew chief. They were giving him a hard time no, on yeah. Saturday Well, night. but here's the deal. Here's the deal. I, 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 let me say this. I Nothing against Cole Witt, but I will speak on behalf of the fans and say, when you invest in a season like fans invest in, in our season and are as dedicated as they are, and you get this golden opportunity where the four guys running for a championship are going to restart together and they've got a few laps to go decide it, and, and you have got someone that, that played no role in the race that, that impedes their progress, to me, that, that I think you feel cheated, and I understand their frustration. And yeah, so I, I I'm not going to point the finger at Cole Witt, but I, that, the way that ended was certainly disappointing. If Cole Witt had five laps on his tires, it would have been fine. But the guy had 30-some laps on his tires, which we knew Jimmy was G- not even going to be close. Jimmy Johnson couldn't have made that work. <laughs> well, maybe Jimmy Johnson. Maybe Jimmy. <laughs> well, if the caution came out. But, yeah. <laughs> one, that, uh, one that I had to bring up, and even though I think it's a ridiculous question, a lot of people were, uh, were talking about it in the comments, and I said that I'd bring it up. Evan in Maryland asks, or he says, explain to me why and how you are absolutely sure NASCAR is not controlling the outcomes of these races. <laughs> I know. I mean, what? It was I mean, the number. I, I said I would bring it up because they I were telling I me I was how afraid we, to. I don't know how we answer that. I mean, I, I think that, you know, and, and I don't know what, what they're referring to there. We're I all apparently assume, paid by, Na- like, NASCAR tells us what to say every day. And, and I mean, I would assume... Opinions. You know, I would assume that the reference here would be to the caution that, that, that came out late in the cup race, mm-hmm, you know, yeah. because, you know, Carl Edwards left a little hint of belief that maybe we could have, you know, kept the caution in the flag stand and, and we never would have had the the caution that created the restart, you know, where he and Logano got together. But, you know, it's not, you know, when you when you look at it from our perspective, we had these same people early in the year that said that Toyota had paid off NASCAR, and that's why they were having all that success. Yeah, what happened to that? I don't believe Toyota's that either. Check I guess they didn't clear. pay enough money to not I have guess that caution that was come it. out. That was it. They didn't pay enough money, and therefore... Jimmy the outbid them, I guess. Mr. Hendrick outbid them at the Absolutely. last race. Yeah. So and hopefully there, all I, that money goes to charity. I, I told you guys that I would bring it up. <laughs> um, Natasha, she says, uh, why do you think Jimmy does not have the same kind of fan following that Dale Earnhardt had during his career? I think it's all personality-related. You know, and it's funny, I, I, I was with some NASCAR fans over the weekend that are, you know, they're, they're good, humble people, and they, they like people like Jimmy Johnson, but they did not subscribe to him winning the championship because, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy is the quiet guy that lives in his little corner of the world. And I think that some fans want a little bit more flamboyancy out of their athlete. Jimmy's not going to give you that. I, I happen to love all the things that make Jimmy Johnson who he is. But there are a lot of race fans that want someone with that edge. Jim, Jimmy is in that guy. That's not who he is. He, he just doesn't, he doesn't come off that way. That's not, that's not the human that he tries to present. Well, and, and Earnhardt certainly had a huge following. But there were a lot of people that didn't like Earnhardt when he was mm-hmm. driving yeah. because of the style he drove. I mean... You look at the fans that Tony Stewart, like Tony has a big following. Jeff Gordon had a big following. Like to try to sway fans from you were racing against both those guys. So you're not gonna necessarily pick up those fans from those guys when you're competing against them. And I think it's just no, that's a good point. I think it shows just I think it's great because I think there's a diversity of the fans in terms of who they're a fan of. It's not just one or two guys that everybody's a fan of. And I, I grew up junior. a Dale Earnhardt fan. I was alive on this planet for about an hour before my grandfather put a Wrangler hat on my head. And for everyone to say that everyone was an Earnhardt fan while he was racing is absolutely not true. No, like, go listen, I was actually go listen sometimes to the grandstands when they introduced the guy. <laughs> he got a lot of right. booze. But, so, but Johnson's the best vanilla we've ever had. Oh, yeah. But like, he, he's, but, he's just so vanilla, but it's, it's like hmm. he's, the best, he's the best vanilla. Yeah, but here's the thing, though. You can't, you can't <laughs> find, sm- but you so can't, smooth. but you can't find someone, though, that balances all the success that he's had better than he does. I mean, the, you know. Oh, he, I agree, but he's just so vanilla. No, he's very middle of the road. Yeah. He's very middle of the road, that's, and that's his personality. And hey. I have a very important question from Kimberly. All right, she last says, one. She says, more hubcasts next year, question mark. Sure, what the heck? It sounds like a plan to me. Yeah, only, only if Ben will let us do it. 
we're right, getting so a, we're thumbs getting the up. thumbs up from all right, our CJ, producer. Great job but thank you year. to our producer Ben Slacker. He's he's been behind the desk all year, so I don't know if he's got his GoPro on, but I want to say right. thank you to Ben. Hey, uh, good job, CJ. Thank you. And uh, fellas, it was fun. Yeah, thank I'm gonna you. go. I'm taking a vacation like the next <laughs> yeah. two months. Yeah, yeah. starting right now. <laughs> yeah. But I did tell you guys I'd buy you dinner, so sometime I'll do that. I want to back for I want yeah. I wanted to go on the record to make sure that you guys knew I wasn't kidding on that. All right. Thanks everybody for watching your participation. Enjoy the off season. We'll see you in 2017.